I stayed at this flat fee brokerage. Hello. And, um, and I stayed at this flat fee brokerage for, okay, I'm trying to figure out how to use this computer that isn't mine. There we go. Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> my kids all give me a hard time because I'm like, is it like an iPad? You know? <laughs> but so, um, so anyway, then I ended up my first year, I still did pretty well. Like my first year, I still did probably about $80,000, which for GCI, which was, and I didn't even know what GCI was, by the way, that acronym until I got here. But anyway, so I didn't know all the acronyms in real estate, but do you know what that is? Yeah. Gross commission. So, uh, but, and then I just kind of stayed level being at a flat fee brokerage. Like it just was kind of like, you know, level, but I could feel my business was growing. And I went, I, eventually I went over to a different brokerage. I was at ERA for like two years. Uh, no, sorry. Only a year. I was only there a year. Um, and then Jen Jurgensen, <laughs> like we'd stayed in touch the whole time. And I saw that she had gone to KW and I just needed, I could feel my business growing and I knew something was happening, but I was like, I don't know what to do. And I remember I went to my broker and I said, I need help. And I don't even know. Meanwhile, I, I had never heard of millionaire real estate agent book or anything else. Right. I'm like, what am I doing? Cause I'm going to lose my mind. And I remember, cause I, I started in two markets. So just so you know, I did half my business in St. George because of vacation homes, half my business here. So I drive, I still do. I'm like on the road all the time. So I just remember my breaking point was I'm in Fillmore paying $10 to use the internet in my car to write up an offer. And I'm like sitting in my car and here's this truck driver like right here. And he just kind of like waves to me and I'm like, Hey, how you doing? And I'm writing my offer. And I was like, there has to be a better way. And <laughs> this is, this is not working for me. So, um, I ended up, I remember I came over here, talked to, well, cause I talked to Jen Yerkes and she's like, come over to KW. I met with the team leader and I remember I cried in his office three times, like in the first meeting, I am not a crier, but I cried three times because I was just like so overwhelmed. I was like, I just need help. And I, I don't know. I, and you know, and they were just like, okay, here's a red book to read. And here's this. And I went, like, there's a plan. And I remember I actually came down and I saw these posters right here. And I remember the third that says moving from E to P. And basically moving from entrepreneurial to purposeful. And I remember I stared at that poster for a long time because I'm a great entrepreneur, mo most likely like all of you. But I was like, I need to move to purposeful. And that was this huge moment for me, looking at that, po for that poster and just being like, there's a plan. And there were people in here in this office that were just doing amazing and great things in real estate. And so I was just like, okay, I'm so glad that I came over here. And like I said, within that, um, that first year I was here, my volume almost tripled in that first year, just from having a little bit more leverage, like a transaction coordinator and from other things. So it was, um, it was, like I said, it's so funny when I get calls from people and they're like, Oh, do you want to come over to whatever? I was like, no, absolutely not. <laughs> you know? No, I am like, I remember I went to the KW I actually just completed three years here because I came over right at during Black Friday, like, you know, like right at Thanksgiving. And I remember I went in online to the KW store and bought like $500 worth of like KW gear because I was so excited about being here. So anyway, but um, that's kind of my background. Um, I'll be pretty transparent with you. This, this last year has been a little bit rough, you know, for some agents, but after I got my head in the game. So I kind of had this rough summer and then, um, just kind of just, even just for me, it was just me. It was a, it was a lot of just other things. Right. And then I just said, okay, I'm going to have a killer fourth quarter. And I just moved back to my mindset and just said, okay, I'm, I'm going to do this. And usually my fourth quarter, I'm a little bit different with how, um, my schedule works because, um, and not schedule, I should say just who I kind of service and when, but that fourth quarter, I do a lot with investors because, you know, your typical family is not wanting to move at Christmas time. Right. So I just, this last, this fourth quarter, I basically just said, okay, who is it? What do they need? And I just started reaching out to people. And as soon as I did that, um, I've just, my fourth quarters exploded. It's actually probably been one of the best quarters I've ever had in real estate. 
So I'm probably on track to make in this fourth quarter what I made all year, um, this, this whole year. So just getting your mindset. So what I'm trying to say in this is get your mindset in. And, and one of the other things I wish I would have known, and I'm going to just do a lot of like little things like this. And then by the way, we're going to have Q and a after too. So, but just feel free to ask questions or whatever. But, um, I, I don't think I realized how much it was mindset until even probably about three years ago. It was actually when I was coming to KW and I just said, and I, at the time I'd kind of been in this part-time mode of like, okay, cause I wasn't fully letting go of some things in my life. And I finally just, I remember I had this moment. I remember exactly where I was at. I remember my husband was just sitting down. He was reading something and I looked at him and I said, I'm in this full time and I'm going to go to KW and I'm going to be the best agent that I can be. And I'm, and I said, I'm just going to kill it. And I said, and I need you to support me and be hundred percent. And he, my husband's amazing. And he just listened to the whole thing. And he's like, I have been waiting several years for you to figure this out on your own. Cause I know you can do it. But I, it was like this mindset thing for me where, and when people ask me, well, how did you triple your production when I went to KW? Yes, it was certain things with systems, but it wasn't that as much as it was my determination. And it was just that moment. And then I looked at my husband, I kind of got mouthy, right? And I said, I'm going to make more than you next year. Okay. So he, of course, my husband made me a spreadsheet of how much he made and with stock and everything. And then I was like, Oh crap. Like, I don't know if I can do that. So then I really had to put my mind to it. And I worked my guts out that next year because I wanted to beat him. We didn't know who won until we went to our accountant. And I remember we went into the accountant's office and I was like, okay, who won on this? And, and he like figures it out. I mean, it was just super funny. And he like, looks and he finally goes Heather by $500. And I beat my husband by $500. (laughs) So the reason I tell you this is because then mindset matters. It really does. And get the people in your life that will support you and that believe in you and that know you can do this. And if this is really what you want, then go for it and go all in and just say, I'm going to be the best agent I can be. And that's what I'm going to do. And, and you'll do it. That's the thing that's crazy is if you really focus, you'll do it. So, okay. That's, that's my, intro. (laughs) So today we're going to talk about make and receive offers. And then I just want to talk to you about just a bunch of other things. And if you have questions, I'm going to give you some of my hacks of what I do. Um, because I think this is one area where I am really good in in any market I can. Okay. Let's see if I, okay, of course this doesn't want to work now. Okay. So now let me try it over here. Okay. Um, hmm. I know. I'm like, okay, let's see. I don't know why this is not. Okay. Where do I point this? Maybe am I pointing it wrong? Okay. I'm like, we really, oh yes. I I love tech help. (laughs) Okay. Let's see. No, but you know what? Maybe I can just use the keyboard. I can also, should I use that? Maybe this will be easier. Okay, let me see if I can do this. No. Okay, Ritz, if you're listening, (laughs) sir. (laughs) Okay, let's see. Okay, oh, maybe. Good idea. Okay, wait. No. Well, I don't know what to click. That's what I was going to say is I can't figure out if there's anything to click. Okay. Well, okay. Does this? It's not just me? Okay. Yeah, except except Hunter, right? Okay, let's see if I can really figure this out. What is the up arrow? 
it beeps at me. Okay, I'm going to text Hunter and say, help me. Okay, let me tell him. Calm down, woman. Just tell her you. Ask Heather. She'll tell you the same thing. That what? Don't tell her you're black. And then a skunk. Yes. Is it so funny? Sister. Yes. Hmm. Okay, well, until we can get back to the slides, but these slides, to be honest, are pretty sick and not very exciting. So I'm going to just kind of tell you, have you all practiced writing up a rep C? Have you a little bit? Have Do they have you do that in this class? Mm. Okay, because I would just say, one of the best things to do is just to keep practicing, like just also write or look at other people's. The other thing I would do, does Jeanette come and teach anything? Do you know Jeanette that she's like the office TC? She basically just like corrects our um, case studies. Okay. Good. Okay. See, you all are, it is so good. That's good. I love it because honestly, that's really what you really that's how you're going to get good because I remember when I got my like when I was writing my first offer like I was just like ah I don't know what I'm doing and how much time do I need for due diligence and what do I need you know so it was really um kind of just you know a learning thing and now it's like you have to get very comfortable with it but what I love about our office is that also having Jeanette here is really great because I will just say as a new agent, do they require you to have used Jeanette? Yeah, I'm glad. And you know what? If I were you, my advice is always keep a transaction coordinator. Like, it, because you know what? And, but review what they write and what they do. So also in a former life, besides being a cosmetologist, I also am pol politician and this and things. I had, um, I was a paralegal. For a few years in California. So I'm really picky about my contracts. So I'm like, I have to, I want to like make sure that things are written up well, you know? And that's something that I can tell you in real estate right now, like just as kind of a little hack is that I'm always shocked at how many agents, even very experienced agents, like they'll send over a contract and I've made mistakes too. So it's not like I'm saying I'm perfect in this, but go over it and sometimes have another set of eyes on it. And that's why I like using a TC as well. Um, but because a lot of times there might be ambiguity and ambiguity is what leads to lawsuits. <laughs> so because if there's ambiguity, then people go, I don't remember what we agreed on, you know? And I actually just recently had somebody who wrote up an offer and um, he wrote up an offer. I was on the, se the seller side. And he did not specify. I knew what he wanted, but he didn't specify in it. Oh, okay. How, what? So it's with this. It's this clicker. It's either this clicker or the mouse. You don't change it on here, actually. Okay, right, right, right. Okay, right. So here. Okay. It's just this. Right. Yeah. Okay, so I just can go like this. Yeah. How? I'm telling you, it did not work for me, Hunter. You are magic. As soon as you show up, it's like, it's like, Hunter's here, we'll behave. Okay. Amazing. So, and, and these are boring and I know, so even kind of what the story I'm telling you, I'm going to integrate it kind of back to this belief system because at the time, and there are times where, you know, um, you know, obviously I want to represent my client the best. I'm also going to do what I can to make sure they get the best, you know, deal. But I always think of one of these slides too, which is the win-win or no deal. And what I realized when I was working with this other agent, this was just recently, a recent story. Um, he was a commercial agent, but he was writing up an offer for a friend and he, it involved water shares, which let me tell you, if you, your first deal that inc includes water shares, you need to talk to somebody who's done deals with water shares. Cause it's, let me tell you, that's a whole nother thing. And so he didn't write in 
the water shares. And I knew that, that he did, that that's what he wanted. We'd already had a verbal about it and everything. And I could have said, Hey, I mean, we'd already accepted the offer and everything. And then I kind of reread and I thought, you know what, there's ambiguity here. So I gave him the opportunity and I said, you know what, let's rewrite that or, you know, send me the addendum. And, and he was very thankful after, but I feel like always be the agent that I call it good juju, right? You want the good juju to follow you. And you don't want to be like, when I first got into real estate, I think I looked at other agents as they were competition instead of they're more your coworkers. And so you've got to remember that you're going to cross paths with these agents several times. Like I cross paths with certain agents. I mean, we've now done several deals together, even people in our office, which is kind of funny um, to the point where now I'm like, Hey, do you want to buy this? Cause I, we just got finished on this other deal, you know? So, um, so anyway, I would just say one of the things to do is always is kind of the win-win, you know, and, and like the belief system, I really like a lot of these, but just knowing, I don't think I had that same perspective when I was a new agent. Like I said, I, I kind of viewed other agents as, you know, like, oh, they're out to get me or, you know, but you have to remember, like now when I go into a deal, I look at them as they're a coworker and I have respect for them for the job that they're doing as well. And I think that's really important to do. And what's interesting is when I came over here, I was also the top recruiter for the first two years, not, not intentionally. I didn't even know there was an award for that. But I was just because I was so happy. I really liked it here. And people were like, oh, coming over then after as well. So, um, but just know that. And even, you know, tell the other agent, you know, hey, I'm excited to work with you. Um, and I will tell you, there are deals that I've seen on my end or even on the other end that a lot of times it matters how you're behaving to that other agent. And if your deal gets accepted or not. This, this one that I'm in right now, this other agent is just kind of, and it's her home that she's selling. Oh, okay. And I mean, she just is constantly making me feel good about what I'm trying to do, even though she knows I do. Yeah. Know? But it, she, she's doing really well and she's making me look good too. It, so, and yes. I appreciate that. So, and that you're working agent, together. Yeah. yeah. Right. She's making me look good. So that's, that's I love that. Yeah. yeah. I've heard of her. We've probably shown each other's home. Yeah. And, and that's what I think is really important is, you know, like, and I actually try to do that as well. Like, I don't want that other agent to ever feel like I took advantage of that or that I wasn't a collaborator um, because like I said, you never know if you're going to end up at the same brokerage on the same team, um, anything. It, Utah's still a very small place. And, you know, I just always feel like just put kindness out there and it comes back as well. And so I really like what you said on that. Um, but just know that. And that's one of my big things. And, and it sounds crazy, but really about receiving, making and receiving offers, your behavior to that other agent really does matter. Because I've had other people, like I had, a, I was liquidating a trust a few years ago and this one agent was really difficult and kind of crazy. And my clients were like, it's not worth their offer of $1,500 more. We'll take the lesser offer just because we just feel better about it. We want it to be a smooth process. They were, they were liquidating like nine properties and they were like, we don't, we can't deal with that bandwidth and that bad energy. So it really matters. And I even on my own house, I took an offer that was probably about $2,000 less because I wanted to work with the other agent that was very good. The other agents I have had, this is another one, make and receive offers, key point. I've had agents even recently that will send an offer, never text me and say, oh, I've sent an offer, no phone call. And especially when things get busy. And I think this next year when we're going into spring, summer, we're going to probably get really busy again. We may go back to multiple offer because um, it's a presidential election year. So, <laughs> so it's, uh, there's just some things that happen. But just so you know, if we go back to multiple offer, I mean, there's times where it's like if I get 10 offers on a property, you know, it's who stands out to me. 
right? And so one of the things I'm actually, I want to talk to you a little bit about multiple offer, as crazy as it sounds, because we're in a different market. But there are things that matter, I think, and things that, that work in a multiple offer situation um, or even just in any offer situation. So some of those things, I would just say, number one, you want to call the other agent and you want to, first of all, just say, like, the, the thing that I talk to them, I try to become their friend <laughs> right off, right? I want to get to know them. Usually we have something in common. I try to build that kind of relationship of trust. So the first thing I would say is you've got to build that relationship of trust with the other agent right off. And if they're really short on the phone, like, because mm, mm, that does happen, right? Or they don't respond. Yes. And I've had that happen too. Um, and if they're, if I really cannot get a hold of them, I still try to call because I know they're going to respect the fact that I called and I left a voicemail that nobody listens to. Right. But I, yes. But, I mean, I called back. I wanted to call you back. But I didn't get the number. Yeah. No, I, I, exactly. No, that's a good point. So I just say right off and I tell them, I say, hey, and if it's a multiple offer situation or if I know that it's a, a high demand property, I just say, look, my client loves this. We want to talk to you. I want to, you know, find out what's important to your sellers besides price. So my, my first question to them is then I say, in addition, obviously, be, besides price, what else matters to them? And it will be surprising what they tell you. Because sometimes if it's like a divorce, I've lately been doing a lot of divorce situations. A lot of times it's ease. They don't want drama or they need a flexible move out date. And I'm like, like we just actually, we got this one deal on a property just recently because of that. Because we were able to say they had an offer for more money, um, but we were able to say, hey, we have, we can give you two weeks of flexibility, like on the close, you know, so like we can write it in. And we even said that um, in the addendum, we basically said they, they had it till a certain date and then they could give us like an extension. We would give them a free extension. And so, but basically finding out what is it that they want? What is it that they need? Do they need a lease back? Do they need, um, like I said, sometimes it's not even money. It's like, hey, we just, sometimes it's more time for communication or whatever it is. It would be surprising. The what? I wanted to give a loan. They yes. They didn't have premium on the deck. One would be a loan, it would be tougher. So we looked at the other people that had conventional. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. And what we'll sometimes do in that situation is I'll come back and I'll actually have them write it up. So I just did a one that was similar to that. And basically we said the maximum out of pocket to us was $400. And basically the other thing that I'm going to tell you right now, and this has been one of my newer tricks that I like to do is I set the expectation up front before home inspection. I just say, look, we're going to take your lower price because in this market, we're talking lower prices, right? I say, but we're not going to haggle a lot over this home inspection. You know, we're going to come in. It says you choose if you want it. If you don't, sure, you can come and ask us for things, but just know where my client stands already is that we are not negotiating anything. It's a, you know, we've already taken $10,000 off the price. So we're really confident in moving forward. Well, the thing that's tricky is when you say as is, it really, it, 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 it's a nebulous thing. Yes, because somebody might say, oh, well, this was as is, but oh, we didn't notice there was this damage before or whatever. It's, it just doesn't really guarantee you anything. What I found is even if you say property to be purchased as is, is, in as is condition, um, it, it's just, they can still cancel if they want. They can still do whatever. I just tell them the expectation right up front. And I just say, um, you know, so in this market where we're not in multiple offer, because a lot of times then they're going to come back, they're going to want 10,000 in repairs. And so the only way that the VA loan and some other things like that, that work is we'll just say, look, we have a limited budget for repairs. 
So if you want it, you can, you can, you can do those repairs hundred percent. They're just going to have to pay out of pocket. And that's what happened. Just, I mean, like, as in I'm closing this week, um, on a house down in St. George that, um, that's kind of what happened. He used a VA loan, but he knew ahead of time. And the other thing I'm going to tell you about making and receiving offers is the other reason I like to have all this dialogue up front is it, it basically paves the way to closing and expectations because when deals go wrong is when people don't have their expectations met. So if I'm already very clear with them at the beginning and I say, here's the budget, because in this situation, um, my client actually had had a, an offer for a higher amount, didn't take it even after I'd said, you need to take that. This is a great offer, but it's still the client's decision, right? And I said, you may get a lower offer later. And, and, tr and you know, and she was like, no, I'm willing to kind of risk it. Well, she got a lower offer later. So the other person, she didn't take the one offer. And there were some things like closing time and stuff that she didn't love. So she got an offer now for less, but she's okay. She's actually kind of okay with it because I had already kind of paved that for her and said, this is what this can look like. And in my experience, usually the second offer is not for more money. It's very rare. Usually it's your first offer that's for the most amount of money because it's somebody who's already been looking in this area for a house, meeting these criteria, you know? Yes. So there was, so in the VA addendum, there's a VA addendum. So if they're doing a VA loan, it actually, you can do, you can tell them you want the addendum and it'll say maximum out of pocket. So basically we'd said, we'll be willing to contribute up to 400. Now they can come back. And of course they did. They came back and they wanted 3,500 worth of, I call it Santa's wish list. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I call it, you know, they're going to make up Santa's wish list and, oh, we want a new water heater, even though it's not broken, but it's older and we want this and we want that. Now, really it's not, you know, it's like hazardous things, things that are truly hazardous, right? Like if there was radon or something, then you'd, you'd be needing to do that. So like I said, I found, and like I said, let me be clear on this, expectations upfront matter. I have never, knock on wood, had anything really fall apart at the closing table because if it is going to, if the person's going to cancel then with working with me, it's going to be because we've already kind of known that here's our expectations, here's what we need. This is how it's going to be done. And if that isn't for them, I love that phrase too. This may not be for you, <laughs> right? But if it is, we'd love to work with you. But we need you to understand this is, this is where we're at. And so, you know, so I think being, there are times when you just need to be really clear about the offer that you're making. And like I said, it's not just the Rep C, it's kind of, I kind of like to paint the picture for them of what we're going to do till closing. Yeah. Okay. So I had to go see some houses that your people were murdered in yesterday. I've been in one of those. Positive. There was like subway at each one somebody got it. There was pentagrams on the, oh. on the wall, two of them. I mean, I'm not Interesting. joking. Interesting. By your mouth next door. Okay. So scary. Mm -hmm. I walked around with my arms like this and just touched the thing and then sanitized. Sanitized after, yes. Yeah, the door, we opened it, wasn't actually connected to the frame. Oh, oh, Especially okay. Called it a yeah. treasure. Yes, that is a treasure. Yes. And, and then, this is when you call it education and experience. Yeah, I was yes. Like, well, education, that was the first yeah. House they've oh, yeah. And talked about the fire broker agreement, you know, did all that, got those signed because they're going to be young and have no idea and have never lived in, you know, and I'm like, oh, you can't build this house, please, we can't bring it in here. Yes, yes. No. Yeah. And so we're walking through and I left him and I was like, well, I would buy it if this, and I'm like, I walked in and I said to my husband, I'm proud of the act, I look at it, oh, wow. Yeah. He's walked up behind me and he's like, oh my gosh. And I'm like, but 
So when somebody says and they walk in, they're like, I would buy this if I could offer this much money. And I'm thinking to myself, and I'm like, uh -huh. you know, they're not looking different. And you know they're saying something where you're like, well, they, already you're... Off, they already dropped it $100,000. Not mm. this treasure. Oh, wow. Okay. Manufactured home, which I wouldn't purchase anyway, even if it took fifty thousand more dollars. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. At least that much money, and it had an advertised as newly remodeled. I'm like, what the heck is that? Yes. And it was an owner agent, one of those. Oh, like, yes. Oh, it's so dishonest. And it's yeah. Advertised. What do you say when they're like, well, I, well, So, I what do you say to your clients, or what do you say to the agent? Well, they didn't ask me. They were adults. okay. It's my daughter's father. Okay. You know. Yes. So. So what I like to do, I, yes, I, and this is again, going back to expectations. I, before I even, I used to just go and show a lot of homes or do whatever, right? Now I have it narrowed down to where a lot of times I even know the house they're going to buy before they do. Like, and as, as in like, if I know exactly what they need and what they want, then I know exactly what to show them. And so a lot of times then I go back to my list with them. So I'll sit down with them and I make a list and I'll say, okay, what are the non-negotiables for you? Like, what are the things that are the not like must haves, the want to haves, and it would be nice to haves. Okay. So then I use that list and I'll say, okay. Um, and the budget, because the budget is also important. So for me, it's more of like almost a spreadsheet type discussion for them because then I can blame the data, not personality, not anything else. It's the data that they gave me. And I can say, okay, let's look at the data. Does this house fall within your price range? I just recently had a referral and he came over from California and he wants to go look at all these great homes. Well, I know that he really is not qualified to see anything over a certain price range. So I go back to that and I've even had to have the discussion with him of this is what I can do and what I know you're legally qualified to look at. And I'm not gonna show you things that I know you can't afford. And it's not, it, it, and so I've just been very clear with him and I've just had to reset that over and over and kind of keep coming back. But if somebody wants to lowball, I'll explain the market. I'll explain the market and I'll say, while everybody on TV right now is telling you how bad the market is, the market really is not that bad. Interest rates might be higher than you're used to, but the market itself, we still have low inventory. There's not like this, we don't have floods of homes sitting on the market. So yes, prices have gone down and that's why it's a great time to buy because interest rates are up, but prices are down. They're not like people are still not going to sell anything for just, you know, a hundred thousand less than its value, you know? I said, well, that is great. I think that is a really nice thought, but they won't take that offer. I promise you this. We can start at that offer, maybe, but I promise you we would be negotiating and, you know, you'd still mm -hmm. pay more than that. I said, because houses, you know, it already dropped a hundred thousand dollars and there's no way possible. You know, and I like, let's be realistic. And so I would even dial that back. Okay. And instead of saying, okay. instead of saying, I promise you, because you can't promise them. And the other thing is, but the only thing that I would say is I would go back to data and say, okay, the number of, you know, the square feet, like the, hello, <laughs> you're coming. Yes. So, um, so basically what I would do is I would look and I would say, let's look at what things are selling for price per square foot, whether it's renovated or not renovated. So again, I always bring it back to the data and make them come to their conclusion. But I also am not going to waste my time at the same time. So I'll say the other key phrase I'll say is, if this is the house, if this is the house that you really want, are you ready to make an offer today? Well, I asked them if they were ready. Yeah. They said, um, I don't know. This really looks like so much work. And I said, we don't love it then. 
Yeah, that's what I, and then I would just probably say, then it doesn't sound like, let's look at your list. Does it boom, 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 boom? Is it gonna cost over $20,000 or whatever? I even will say, how much are you willing to do? I call it um, just sweat equity, right? As far as like, what are you willing to take on? Are you willing to take on, and I go through a list. I'll say, are you willing to take on paint? Are you willing to take on carpet? Are you willing to take on appliances? What if there's more rehab, yard? Um, you know, and I just go down and I'll say at about what price range, like what are you willing to put out of pocket in this transaction? Because a lot of times if it's a younger couple, they don't have a lot of cash to put down on it. So a fixer upper is not necessarily the best thing for them, well, you know? Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I would say, and then again, going back to data, I would say in this situation, and this is a great one. I'm glad you're, we're talking about this. I would say, okay. And sometimes it only takes one time to show a house like that. So sometimes I will do it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I'll, but I'll say, do you have the paint is going to cost roughly probably 5,000. Um, this is going to cost this, this is going to have this. Are you willing to put that money out from taking it out from your down payment and doing those repairs outside of the loan? And it makes them answer that question. And like I said, I like to make them come to their own conclusions because they will come to the right conclusion. And she'll put her foot down. And the thing is, I also explain construction right now. I'll say, here's the thing. Construction is still not cheap. This is not the day, like since COVID, people are not willing to frame homes anymore at $15 an hour. Nobody in any kind of service industry, plumbers are not going to be cheap. Like I go through and I actually will say, here's what you're looking at price-wise. Like and unless you've got some relative who's willing to come and work for free and do this and who's good, then this may not be the product for you. Yeah, in some things. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so, and the thing is, even since then, now it's like, I just basically will say, okay, this is what you're looking at. But like I said, like the key, if nothing else today, I want you to think about that it all should be upfront. What I've learned is the more work that I do upfront before I make an offer, before I receive an offer, the more data, the more work, the more I've managed their expectations on both sides, whether I'm representing the buyer or seller. But then if I do all of that, the rest of the process is easy. I compare it to like building a home, right? And like, if you go in, you've pre-picked everything, you don't have any changes. You're like, okay, this is my flooring. This is my everything. You get all of the things picked out and then you just have them build it. It's a pretty seamless process because you're only catching like little mistakes, right? But they already know. And it's already in the paperwork. Oh, this is what needs to be the stone on the fireplace. This is what everything is. And then no one has any unmet expectations. And one of the other pieces of advice I'm going to give you in this too is I never throw the other realtor under the bus, kind of what you were saying. And like I said, the, the guy that I just worked with that he had kind of messed up on his contract about these water shares, it could have cost his, his client about $100,000. I mean, we're not talking a small amount of money. It was a big amount of money. And let me tell you, he was very thankful that I caught that and that I let him know. And I said, okay, this is what I think you're trying to write. And this is, you know, you're probably going to want to revise this. And the thing is, like I said, I really like that. And what's interesting that, that after we got that all done, the rest of the transaction was super easy, you know, but like I said, it's really preparing. And if you have questions, when I receive an offer, the other thing is if there's any ambiguity or if there's anything in it that I may not like, I get that agent on the phone and I say, Hey, my clients, because a lot of them won't call me. Now, again, I'm telling you my process. I always call the agent before I write the offer. 
because I want to know what's important to their client. And I say, what is it like due diligence? I basically have reviewed almost everything I'm going to write into that offer with the agent over the phone before I send it. Because then it also cuts down on like, we don't have nine addenda, right? I mean, or we shouldn't, right? But I basically say, okay, due diligence, this is what I think, you know, it sounds like from listening to you, you need a quick due diligence. Like a lot of times that's another thing. Sometimes they just say, we want you to do your home inspection. We want to know if you're moving forward within a week. Doable, totally doable. So like, I will actually go to them and I'll say, okay, what, you know, here's what I'm thinking for timeline. I just did this on a huge, it's actually probably been one of my bigger deals, but it was a $2.5 million home. And I said, and I mean, before, and she was a great agent and we went over everything in detail because I, my clients are very complicated and it's a, uh, she doesn't know the situation, but they were divorcing. And so, but it was very hard to get a hold of all parties and we had to deal with lawyers and trust me, it was a ah, crazy transaction, but um, so I needed it to all be very well thought out and, and even down to the due diligence when closing was, when move out. I mean, we were very specific and, um, and that kept that deal together. And if we would not have been, I think one of the parties, cause it, like I said, it involved lawyers and everything else. I think one of the parties would have kind of caused it to crash. Well, you said that my nephew's um, boyfriend was a big ending and he absolutely said that he's starting to make everything much more difficult for realtors in home selling for divorces. Yeah. He said they are the ones who have caused all the drama uh, in home selling. He's not necessarily wrong on this because he said, he said it actually, attorney. we had the, but guess what? I actually talked to one of the attorneys and because my dates and everything else was ironclad and his client had already signed it, there wasn't anything that he could do, but he would have bombed it. He actually told me, he actually told me, he said, I would actually not have them selling this. Mm -hmm. Well, they're billing, they're billing hourly. So they don't have any, they don't need, they don't need resolution and, and they don't. Yes. And there's no resolution for them. What I found is it depends on the lawyer because I've had some great lawyers I've worked with that basically are just like, hey, and you know, the other thing I want to be clear about is, and, and this, I cannot be even so specific on, make sure, like I said, that you can articulate a plan to your client or to whoever is involved because the thing that I've learned also is I love the phrase, I'll say the next steps are, the next steps are. So after we've talked about it, then I'll say the next steps are, we're going to go and look at homes or whatever it is. The next steps after that are, we're going to do this next steps. Because one of the things that I think agents could do so much better on, and it would be huge is the Biggest reason I think I have a great SOI and they're very, very loyal. I don't really do any marketing. I just have, it's all repeat client referral, but they're very loyal to me, but it's because I give them confidence and you need to give your clients confidence and have that. I knew you were going to ask this. Yes. No. And you know what? And that's okay. I would say that's when it kind of comes into like Angie, right? Is kind of helping. And she's amazing and to net. And I would say that's what you really need. But yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Maybe they'll do it first, but I feel like it's as a class. I mean, I want to make the buyer's checklist. What are the steps? Well, I want to make a seller's checklist. What are my steps? There's some online. If you Google that, you can actually find some. My question and I, I actually should have one. I should do that. I, and I've thought about it for a long time. How do you think about the process and making So that's a great question. I am actually not a fan of backup offers. And I'll tell you why. Um, well, it depends on the property. I have had one time that um, we did do a backup offer. 
didn't really, I've never really had one turn out. So if I'm on the seller side, I'm going to say, if I'm on the seller side and somebody wants to make up a backup offer, I, a lot of times don't want it because then it locks me in. Like, let's say deal number one falls apart. I would want to go back live on the market and let it be an open market for other people to come in, do a big open house, do some marketing and see what all I can draw. Because who knows if that's really the best offer, right? And so um, if it's like a cash deal, if it, I mean, if there are some serious indicators, okay. Yeah, yeah. And that's probably, and that would be probably a situation. Yeah. Um, but I'm somebody that like, I will stay in touch with that agent and I will say, okay, how's it going? Or I'll ask them when due diligence ends because then I know kind of when, like I'll, I'll ask some questions and find out, okay, um, let us know if there's any indicators that you're, you know, that the client may not, you know, go through with it. So, but I will, I have done it before. And if you're in a multiple offer situation, it's not necessarily a bad idea. But a lot of times if you're on the seller side, if I'm on the seller side, I'm most likely not going to encourage them to accept a backup offer, especially if we're in a multiple offer type situation, because I would rather go back on the market, see what other terms we can get, see if there's other things that can happen. And then again, I'm going to go back to my home inspection type thing. I'm going to set expectations right off with the other, the other side and just say, hey, here's what we're going to do. And like I said, if you present a plan and even if they have questions for you and you don't know and you're like, okay, mm, say, you know what, that, those are great questions. Let me get back with you on that. I don't ever answer. If there's something that I really don't know the answer on, never answer it on what you think. It's what you know. And so what I say is I will say, okay, that's good information. I'll say, let me take that back to my client or let me talk to their lender or whatever it is, right? Another thing is sometimes just kind of as a side note, sometimes the lenders, maybe they do qualify for more, but the lender's written, you know, a prequal letter that says up to 700,000 or something. You, like, I always call the lender and I'm like, number one, how solid are they? How are we looking? What can we do? And sometimes they'll say, oh, actually they're qualified to up to 800. They just only wanted to do 700. And then I'll go back and I'll talk to them and say, okay, where, you know, just so you know, you are qualified for more, but are you in this comfort zone? Is this your comfortable level? Because I still don't want to show them things, even if they are qualified for that, unless they tell me they want to see things in that price range. Then I'll say, okay, uh, that's good information. We'll stay for here for right now, you know? And sometimes what I might do is I might expand their search. Like if I've set them up on like hot sheets, then I'll say, okay, do you want to see things that are maybe 750? And, you know, just in your searching and they'll say, oh yes. Or sometimes they're like adamantly, no. Like I have a lot of older clients that are cash buyers and they'll be like, I want to spend $800,000 on a house, not a penny more. And I'm like, okay, I can respect that. But then that's good information for me because then I know they're not flexible. I know exactly what I need to do. And I, again, Going back to my three areas, what are the must-haves, the would-likes, and the, or sorry, must-haves, the, you know, things that would be really nice to have, and then, yeah, kind of the, and then also the ones that are just kind of like a bonus. But again, going back to that, because then if I know after talking to them, if it's a realistic expectation, if they have unrealistic expectations, then what I do is I show them comps. Again, going back to data. I go, okay, let's look at what sells for 300,000. What's your price range? Just out of curiosity. And that's tough. And so what I would say is, okay, let's look at what has sold in the last 30 days in that price range, because that makes you a valuable asset, but it doesn't make it um, your fault that there's not anything else out there better, right? Again, data, 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 data. Okay. So 
But like I said, I, the reason I kind of want to, it's like, see, I'm still on like today's agenda, but when this, I mean, you all know this, basically the offer process, prepare the offer, write the offer, present the offer, all of this really, again, expectations and have that dialogue with that agent beforehand, because I don't like surprises. And some of, now I will say some agents won't tell me there are some times where an agent will say, well, just write us an offer you know, and I'll say, okay, can you tell us in addition to price, uh, do they need to stay in the home? So then I will ask in a different way. I'll say, do they need to, do they need a flexible or do they want to be out as soon as possible? So I try to kind of, it's like I have a tree structure in my brain. Okay. If this, then this, if this, then this, okay. Is it important that, and some people will tell you this, this sounds crazy, but I've had a deal where this happened not very long ago too, where they just said, we don't want, it's an older uh, woman in this home. She doesn't want any request for repairs. So she wants to know what the bottom line is that you're going to offer and that that's that. Great. Okay. She just didn't want the stress of it. She didn't want anything. And so, you know, she was even willing to take us like a lower price or she would like maybe give us like a set amount or something like that. But again, Going back to where when they see my offer, what I always ask is, is my offer going to be the one that resonates with them? Is this the one that they're going to like, right? And during multiple offer uh, back like two years ago, um, I rarely, and I'm not trying to like, but I rarely lost because I knew up front what that person wanted. And I was shocked at how many people would just send offers because I even sold one of my Airbnbs during that time. And I had probably like 10 offers on it. And I had people that never called me once, never called and said, oh, we, my client really wants this home. They didn't ask questions. They didn't do any of that. And like I said, that's the one that I actually took less money on because I knew it was a done deal. And I didn't have time because I was so busy with my clients. I was like, I'd rather take $1,500 less on this property and deal with this sure deal that I know is going through with a, an agent who's calling me. And it wasn't about how long he'd been licensed. He just was in it. And then you can tell when an agent's in it. He called me and he joked around and he goes, do I need to send you crumble cookies? I mean, we joked around about it. And I was like, please, no, I don't need crumble cookies. I don't, I don't need anything. What I need is a good solid offer. And he was like, my clients can close in 30 days. They're, you know, this, this, and he gave me total confidence. And I went, okay, I would rather deal with that because I knew if I was dealing with another brain damaging situation on my own property, I wouldn't be able to help my clients and make money over here. Does that make sense? So I'm like, it's the opportunity cost. So I basically went with the easy offer because he was such a good communicator. But let's say you're that person, you can never really guarantee anything. Because what if the client, you know, maybe the inspection comes back. And oh, 100%. Now so is it reserved? So you have to be really careful? Yeah. So like what I would say, it, yeah, I think it depends on, I would highlight whatever is the best part of your offer. Does that make sense? So really emphasize, like in your offer, it's like, okay, they are another one that I just had. I had clients that were living in an Airbnb because they had already sold their other house. They had nowhere to go. So like, they really want this house. They're living in an Airbnb and we've got to get this over the finish line. That actually was a huge part because they were like, okay, we know you're going to close. They know that my clients are motivated to get out of the Airbnb. And so, like I said, of course there's no guarantee, but I can do everything I can up front to make those risks very small, very small. Um, once in a while, you can, sometimes like, um, you mean the inspection? Did you say inspection? Yeah. So sometimes, and sometimes I'll even send the inspection with my client's permission over to the seller's agent because I want them to see that it is a real problem. Does that make sense? Or I'll do screenshots of it. Of course, it's with my client's permission, but it, I found 
it actually helps a lot of times because if you just all of a sudden throw out what I hate, I had an agent do this recently who just didn't have any discussion with me after the home inspection, just made the Santa's wish list, threw it over in an addendum, wanted us to sign it and did it right before due diligence was up, literally like a few hours. I don't respect that. I don't respect that at all. They knew it. Um, especially if it has this giant list, it depends. Well, but this is the thing, and I okay, I'm gonna go back to something I say to my clients. Okay, so like I know we're vacillating between seller and buyer, right? When I'm on the seller side or buyer side, one of the things that I say to my clients when they are buyers is because if they are not experienced buyers, depending on if they're experienced or not. They don't know that 80 things are going to come wrong, come back as wrong in the home inspection. And if they're on the selling side, it hurts their feelings, right? Because this is their house that they love. And all of a sudden they're learning that 80 things are wrong with their house. And it like makes them angry and it makes them, and then all of a sudden it taints them a little bit in the deal. So what I like to say up front on whether it's buyer or seller is I actually will say, okay, now we're going to do next steps. Here are the next steps. We're going to schedule the home inspection. Okay, now just remember with the home inspection, and I usually just explain what it is. And I say, this is to help you understand if there's anything hazardous currently, but also you're going to notice that about 80 things come back on this. And some of them are like orange or like kind of a warning. Now it doesn't mean that it's the end of the world. It just means, hey, these are some things to look out for. In the next few years, you may need to replace the water heater. In the next six years, you may need to replace the roof, you know? So I actually give them examples and I'll say, but if we are testing for radon and it comes back as, you know, positive, hey, that's for sure something we need to address, right? With the other agent as well. Um, but like I said, I kind of prep them so that they understand that when they get a home inspection report, that they are already expecting that there's 80 things wrong. I actually use that number because do you know why? Because on my home that I sold when I was an agent, my first transaction, my house that I sold, I had over 80 items that came back wrong. And it was a gorgeous house in Highland. And I was mad because I did, I mean, I'm a new realtor. I don't know what I'm doing totally yet. And I was like, there's 80 things wrong. My house is beautiful and it's amazing. And then I realized later, oh, that's just how inspections are. So I kind of like to prep them for what they're going to see on an inspection. And I say, I've never seen an inspection. For example, I say this phrase too. I've never seen one come back where there's not a flashing problem or roof issue. <laughs> because every inspection I've ever seen has some kind of, even then, even then, I still see flashing. Wow. And see, some people will be like this. Red, yellow, orange, green, blue. I, I yeah. Yep. And it, it just depends on your sellers or your, or the buyers, you know, but that's, mm -hmm. I think it depends. If it's an 80 year old woman that owns the house, that's going to be really overwhelming, you know, as the seller, right. To say, oh. I need to get all of these little things done. Yeah. So, yeah. And see, and I've had, I've had that actually happen as well. So I like to have kind of a conversation first and say, look, you know, again, with the, with the other agent as well and say, look, there's, you know, these are what we've deemed as, you know, the most out of, of course, there were 43 things that came back, but, and the agents are always going to know that. And I'm going to say, these are the top three that my client is concerned at, uh, with, you know, and these we feel are really things that need to be addressed. I have done that on one or two times. I've done that only in a situation where they didn't really know the history as well. And if they wanted to know it was an inherited property. Um, so it's not necessarily a bad thing to do. And, um, I mean, it's a good question for sure. I would just say 
or a lot of times people are expecting something to come back wrong, right? And so, you know, they're going to just ask for a few things. But again, I, I make it very clear to them if there's, you know, how willing my seller is or whatever it is that we're doing, you know. Um, and the reason I do that is because also I've rarely had anybody then cancel. It just does. I don't have, a, I don't deal with a lot of cancellations because I've managed that dialogue up front. And they're not going to be surprised when my client comes back, like just with this VA loan that I'm closing this week, they came back with three, like $3,500 worth of stuff. We'd agreed to 400. So we said, well, this is what we agreed to. This was the conversation we had up front. And, you know, we had told you it's either kind of, you can have your home inspection. You can either move forward or not. And we'll cover $400 and give you a $400 credit towards that. And guess what? They went forward. So the buyers on the other side still move forward with $400 instead of $3,500. Not on every one, but on that one that we did, okay. on that one. And, and some of them I just am very clear about. And depending on the situation, again, going back to knowing my clients and what they can handle, what is, yeah. And it's not even, not, not even just what they can afford. It's what they can take on. Or I just need to know, like, did we come in at a lower price? Like if we negotiated $10,000 off the purchase price, I'm going to say, hey, you know what? That also we're taking into consideration repairs or anything else. And sure, they can ask. They can ask all they want. But I basically let them know your time is to decide during due diligence if you're moving forward or not. And I'm basically calling their bluff a little bit, if that makes sense. So I'm like, just know that and communicate that to your client. I've never had somebody cancel because of that, because I've already told them up front. So do you think you're a part A or yourself? Um, <laughs> no, but you're not. <laughs> I like that. How could you come across as like soft and, you know? I think I come across as strategic. So kind of what you're saying, and because I do, they already know that I know their game. And so I'm kind of calling their bluff. It's not necessarily firm, but I would say I'm very clear because I think there's a difference. Yeah, I think I, it's going back to solid data points or solid points. And when I was a new agent, I want to give you a few ideas. So when I was a new agent, I actually, before I ever had a dialogue with an agent, I would write out the points that I needed to make in the conversation because I wanted to sound more experienced and I didn't want them to catch me off guard. And this goes back to politics, by the way, <laughs> a little bit, because when I would have a reporter call me, this happened often when I worked for the governor and a reporter would call me and say, Hey, we want a statement on boom. And it would be some fresh news story or it'd be something. And we'd be like, sometimes we're blindsided. Sometimes we're not. And what I would always do is I would say, you know what? I will get back to you on a statement. Oh, no, no, no. Because what they try to do is they try to catch you in that moment to get your guard down and get a bad quote, right? So you can never let that happen. So just like that in politics, it's like that with other agents. If I need even to go for a second, if they're just like, you know, whatever it is, I'll say, okay, you know what? Let me call you back in 10 minutes or whatever it is. I always am in control as far and confident because it's the confident and and it's not that I'm not willing to negotiate with that other person it's just they are already very clear on what we're going to do and so there's no surprises there so and sometimes they'll ask like I said this they, I mean I'd had a very detailed dialogue with this agent about ahead of time saying you can do your VA loan that's great but we're not doing more than 400 and I want to be very clear on that and I would just tell them, you know what? It's because we are coming down off the price of 10,000 and we're going to give you 400 on top of that. So really we're coming down 10,400. So there you go. And you, so then you, I. You sound so firm. Like you just said that. I you sound, but you know what I mean? I, I don't want it to sound like a big win. Yeah. No. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Whether you're sounding. Well, and I just had to remind them and I was super friendly about it. I just said, Hey, Rachel, great to hear from you. 
I saw your addendum that you sent over for 3,500. Hey, I just want to remind you, we had already talked about the 400 up front. That's where my client's at. Let's talk about if we still have a deal moving forward. And then she calls me back. Oh, my TC prepared that. This is what they wanted me to throw out. She kind of dialed back, backpedaled because she knew we'd already had that dialogue. So I just said, okay, just saw that you'd asked about that, but we're not, you know, this is where we're at. And just to reconfirm, this is what, you know, we had discussed. And she was like, okay, well, let me have a, another talk with my client. Call me back. Call their client. Okay, this is what we'll do. Like I said, doesn't necessarily hurt to ask, but, and that's what I mean, is that I didn't, there was no drama there. Like there was no drama with her. I was totally nice to her. In fact, we're going to go to lunch next week, but like, she's just like, you know, like, we're just like very friendly with each other. It was just a, again, bringing it back to the data. And like, when I was a newer agent, I seriously would just make bullet points of the things I wanted to talk about in that conversation with that agent. And I, a true story, I remember actually like discussing like home inspections and things. I remember I would stand up, not sit down. I'd stand up, kind of go through my little list, think about how I wanted to present that and then do it, you know, and just kind of have that higher energy. And, um, and so, yeah, that's, that's basically what I would tell you is that again, there's no, I never get emotional about it's not that I wouldn't say I'm never emotional. I would, I don't, because I do feel things for my clients, right? And I do, and I feel empathy for their client as well. But in the end, I have to be in charge of my emotions. And again, if I'm going to bring it back to data and expectations, then I'm not the villain, right? And, and that's where you need to be even with your client. And what I can't stand, I'm just going to give you a little pet peeve, is when I'll hear another agent ripping on other agents, right? And be like, oh, well, this agent is so la, 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 la. You've got to figure out what is that agent's love language, <laughs> okay? Like, is it data? Is it no conversation? Is it, what exactly is it? How, and so I ask myself, how can I communicate best with that other agent? And I try to like, kind of figure out their personality. Um, pretty quickly on how they are going to react. Okay, I'm going to give you two book recommendations too that I want you to read. Okay, so I want you to read, has anybody in here read Crucial Conversations? Okay, that is a game changer for, um, I used to teach a college class too. Um, and I would say the feedback I received was that that book changed people's lives. Like it really changed my life and it's just very easy. It's how to communicate with others. Um, and once you see that it actually gives you like tools and help for it, um, it's a red book. It says how to communicate. It says crucial conversations when the stakes are high, something like that. I was going to say it's less than $15 on Amazon. Yes. And I would, when you read it, there's little quizzes in there for you to take. I started taking it for my personal life. My, my advice would be kind of take those things, personal life, business life, if that makes sense. So I'd kind of answer the questions in two parts. I still read that book probably every 18 months because it, and then I pick one thing out of it that I want to implement that I think is going to be important to do um, in the next little while. But you'll start to meet people and you'll be like, I know you've read that book <laughs> because the way that they'll restate things or they'll say things and you'll go, oh, okay. So I really like that. Um, and I would say just also kind of read about personalities. There's one book that I want to read. I was at a thing with Gary Keller and he recommended it. It's called like the six hats. I'm just starting it. Have you, do you know what I'm talking about? Has anybody read that? Um, it's kind of an older book. I have to look at my audible. Mm -hmm. 
Hey. This is what it looks like. Six thinking hats. And this basically tells you there's six different personalities and you have to figure out which personality you are, which hat you wear, which color you wear, and which color of hat other people wear. What are the different kinds? It's, I can't remember. I just started reading it. It's like, um, but there's some people that are like, yeah, data, emotional, you know? And so like, if I am dealing with an emotional agent, then I still am clear. I give them more empathy and I'm very much more friendly even, but I also try to stay emotionally good with them. But then also I still bring it back to the data. Does that make sense? So, because then they're not going to get overly emotional about anything. No. Not always. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because if I'm dealing, I joke around you guys, the, the hardest clients are not, not lawyers. I have lawyers, doctors, uh, dentists, you know, all of those. My hardest clients are the CPAs. And I'm going to tell you why. And you know what? I will tell you why CPAs are the hardest. Because they look at the past where realtors look at the future. <laughs> so we're like, look at the possibilities with this, whatever. This is great. They're like, okay, but three years ago, the value of it was $20,000 less. Then why would I buy it now? So what's so hard, and I even joke around with my CPAs now up front, and I'll be like, oh, you're my favorite type, <laughs> you know? Like, So they joke around, and I explain it to them, and they laugh about it because they know it's true. And I'll be like, look, I'm selling amazing future, beautiful present and future and they look at the past and in the numbers, right? And so what I also know is that you've got to be able to present numbers with them. And again, data, data, data. And what I'll do for my CPAs is I'll do more on like my um, market analysis for them. I go deeper on that and I'll give them more comps and I'll even go and I go through it with them by phone and I'll say, here's what the actives look like, here's what the under contracts, here's what the souls look like, and here's what the market looked like at the time. And they appreciate that. So if they're a data person and not a talking person or an emotional person, then I know what to like focus in more on. Yeah, no, they are, the, they are by far my hardest clients, CPAs. As soon as, and what's funny, the other, I had a client recently, I was talking to the wife most of the time. Husband never really would talk to me on the phone he worked a lot of hours. And after she had said like four different things, I said, is your husband a CPA? She's like, how did you know? And I was like, I got you. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I got this now. I understand. So anyway, okay. So um, I'm going to jump and read this little quote because this kind of tells you everything. Okay. Let me see right here. Some of the best agents I know love nothing more than a difficult negotiation that gives them a chance to really shine, to acknowledge objections, to discover a solution which both sides can be happy. I agree with that, but I also am going to add what I really can, can get behind is also I do love to negotiate. That is something I know I'm really good at. When I am on that buyer side, I know I'm great at the negotiation. And again, I know exactly where, how hard I can maybe push something or what is important to that other side right so that's why those phone calls to those agents are so critical because then I already can figure out what that other side is looking for and like I said then there's no surprises so when we talk about the process I think all of you kind of know this you know you make the offer seller responds they counter they accept they might reject I very rarely I don't know if I've ever had actually a flat-out rejection maybe once. I have never even really had a flat out rejection just because I already know ahead of time. Uh -huh. And then what? Yeah, but then I get them a better deal and then they are like, yeah, nobody, they all say that, like some of them will be like, oh, it's okay, whatever. But in the end, if I'm getting them a really killer deal, I know they're, yeah, they're going to be really happy about it and they're not going to complain. Nobody's ever complained about getting a house for less money than they anticipated, you know, or like, um, one thing that I've done actually right now is I'll sometimes add in, like, especially like I have, 
like a divorced client, single mom right now. And what we did is we had them prepay her HOA for a year because that is just something that, yeah. So like it's $2,400, right? But that $200 less a month is going to help her with the higher interest rate. And it's also going to help her know what she has. And she really just needs a, a year because she's got this new job and she's doing awesome at it. And it's just going to be kind of a relief to her, you know, for that first year. So I try to figure out, because it's not always closing costs. Sometimes it might be closing costs to roll them in. Um, in her situation, we had them pay her closing costs because she wanted less, the least amount of money out of pocket so that she can kind of subsidize the higher, you know, monthly cost. So then what we did is we rolled in closing costs and then prepaid HOA for a year, which I also am, I'm kind of a fan of the prepaid HOA um, because especially if I have older couples as well, because they're on fixed income. And so a lot of times like they're collecting social security. They're starting to do that. Well, and in California, there's transfer fees of up to like one and 2%. Mm -hmm. And Daybreak is pretty famous for that. Um, it's, a, it's basically somebody in their office at the management company, like re, retyping, okay, here's the new owner. Yeah, but it's just a way for the HOAs to capture recapture some of their their money no i think it's going to get worse actually mm -hmm. i think it'll get to be a higher percentage because some of these hoas are doing landscaping for example right up front and so if they're doing landscaping they're wanting to recapture that money that they just spent on your yard you know so then they're saying, oh, okay. I, and uh, there might be a day. I also, just because I've been involved in politics, I've also, I'm, the last two years, I've helped run legislation up at the Capitol um, for some development type stuff because there was a county um, that was blocking on like basically letting uh, someone develop they would just, they were holding them up in the process. So like basically they were saying, oh, we're not going to respond for six months. So we made it so they have to respond in like 60 days. So there's just little things, but I think eventually that might be something that the legislature would look at and say, hey, and it wouldn't shock me. Yeah. And there's some where like in St. George, it might be like $500. 250 to $500. But when it starts to become a percentage of the price and they're like, oh, it's just 1%. It's like, well, 1% of 700,000 is $7,000, you know, or whatever. So, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if the legislature eventually does do some kind of a, you know, yeah, yeah because I, I, but it would have to be the legislature that would have to, okay, I'm going to learn how to use this. Okay. So, we're, we already talked a little bit about preparing the offer. I'm just scanning through these because these were all pretty basic. So that's why I'm really not using a lot of the slides. Um, but I think all of you kind of know this already, but it's just, you know, first of all, calling to see if it's available. Okay. I think that's kind of a given, right? <laughs> so anyway, build rapport, like we talked about, inquire about um, activity I, and they may not tell you you know, but sometimes I like to tell others, like I just recently had something where I basically said, just so you know, we've had three walkthroughs in the last 48 hours. And that means to that other, that signals to the other agent, hey, they're probably pretty close to getting an offer. So, um, and it's not like I'm saying, you need to make us an offer. I'm just saying, just so you know, again, data, data, facts. Just say, we've had this, and we may be close to receiving an offer. Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. Um, and then just kind of, again, asking about motivations needs. I cannot stress this enough. Like, I rarely have a conversation with another agent. Like, if I'm on the, the seller side, right, the listing, I rarely get a call 
from an agent that says before they write the offer that says, hey, let's talk about this or what are some of the needs that your client has? That would be really huge, right? Or a lot of times I'm proactively calling that person that went through and I'm saying, hey, can you give us some feedback or are you interested in writing an offer? You know, and I'll talk to them about that and get that information from them. Um, but like I said, dialogue, dialogue, dialogue up front. Um, how they receive the offer, I just basically, what I do is I actually do verify their email address because do you know how many times it's it wrong in the MLS or it'll be like, oh, it's going to info at whatever and they're not even going to see the offer. So I always, when I'm sending an offer as well, I tell them I'm sending an offer, look for it within the next, you know, four hours or whatever. And I'll say, and I will text you as soon as we send it. So I like to tell them exactly what to expect from me as far as my communication. So they know they're going to get a text message from me that's going to say, hey, the email or the offer is in your email. And I used team at such and such dot com. Right. But again, I like to confirm all that. And I also tell them it will also be coming from my transaction coordinator, Jeanette Jolly. And I'll say, please reply all because my email's on there as well as Jeanette's. So like I give them instructions before I even send that offer. So they know exactly what to expect. And we've already had the dialogue. So they already know what my clients are going to be sending. There's no like shockers. If there's a shocker, because this has happened, where all of a sudden my client calls me and says, actually, we need the due date, the move-in date to be this. Then what I'll do is I call back the client or the agent and I'll say, just so you know, my client called me, they figured out they're going to Mexico on this day. It would actually be better if they close on this. Do you think that would be a problem? And if there's a problem, they call their client, they call me back. And like I said, th so a lot of times, and sometimes, yes, there will be like an addendum back, right? Or on dates or whatever. But at least we've minimized the things that need to be addressed. It's not like you're starting so far apart because we've already dialogued and they already know what they're receiving. Whether or not they're agreeing to it or not, different story. But they know what they're receiving. So um, this one talks about, yeah, reviewing MLS tax records, produce a comparative analysis. I do the comparative analysis way up front. So just so you know, I do that up front with my clients so they know what they're looking at and what they can find in that price range. Because then there's no surprises. Because then when I get these calls that are like, we want a house, this just happened. We want a house with like a big yard for $450,000 in Lehigh. And I'm like, okay, those are hard to find. Now that's my reaction. Those are hard to find. It might be an older house. Are you okay with that? And then I go and I kind of go back to those like talking points. How you doing? Oh, <laughs> sorry. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm just teasing you. <laughs> yeah. Well, you can come and hang out. We're talking about making and receiving offers. So yes, so much fun. So anyway, and then, um, yeah, and then basically, like I said, there's no surprises then after that, like they already know. And like I said, and if they need, and I always say that if you need, after you receive my offer, if you need clarification or if there's something that we didn't discuss, please give me a call because then I want to have that discussion with them. Or maybe they're like, well, why did you ask for the whatever, you know, uh, refrigerator? or washer dryer or whatever. But like I said, I've always discussed all of that up front. And a lot of times I'll have even just the rep C, especially when I was newer, I would have the rep C in front of me. So I knew exactly the points I was going to talk to them about and just write it in pencil. So even though Jeanette does that, right, I would write it in pencil and say, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to do this. We're going to have this. And then I would just write it in. And then after discussing, I knew what we had. So that's um, what I would take. But okay, I'm saying ahas. Okay, well, and writing an offer, let's just go through this really quick too. Same thing, like I said. And then I always include the buyer pre-approval letter. I'm surprised at how many times people will send something 
okay, actually, I have to tell you my funniest story. Um, this happened six months ago. So had this client, I'm on the sale, the, the listing side. Um, we're selling this really cheap uh, condo down in St. George. And I got this couple that called me, unrepresented buyer. And they were like, oh, we just have cash. And I was like, okay, that's great. I just need verification of funds. So, and they were like, well, we don't keep it in the bank. They were like preppers from New Mexico. I kid you not, this is a true story. They said, we'll send you photos of our cash in Home Depot buckets downstairs. And I was like, okay, number one, you can get cash in Home Depot buckets, like a picture off the internet, right? Yeah. Or whatever. Yeah, that's not proof of fun. So I had to explain to them because it was kind of an older couple. I said, you're going to have to make an appointment with your bank because do you have a bank account? I had to ask them, do you have a bank account? Yes, they had a bank account. You're going to need to make an appointment to take in your Home Depot buckets of cash and have them count it because this is $250,000 that they had in cash in their basement. And there was much more of it. I talked to their, I talked to their daughter and she's like, actually, they have even more than that. But um, because you can also get flagged for fraud or drugs or different things if you all of a sudden show up with all this cash at a bank. So I said, you're going to have to talk to your bank, make an appointment. And they were like, why do we have to do this? Because they're older, right? And they're like, we, shouldn't, we should be able to just show up at title and give you the buckets of cash. And I said, yeah, that's not going to work. And so anyway, so we basically just had to help them through that process. And they did. Eventually, it took them about two weeks. And I think the bank had to clear the money to make sure it wasn't marked for any kind of drugs or anything. So anyway, it did push out closing. But like I said, so cash in buckets, in Home Depot buckets, not proof of funds. Okay, just to be clear, not proof of funds. Um, and then... Like I said, I would do, oh, wow, we're like, sorry, I'm like, I'm really slow here. Um, yeah, kind of, like I said, I like this part, repair limits. Sometimes you just want to even put it in there. Talk through the offer, um, you know, review the contract. And like I said, I like to review it with my clients before I send it as well. And then I send it to them, to the, but I do this over the phone. Like I'll send them even like after we've talked about it, and especially when I was new, I would talk about it first, put it in there. Then I would re go over all the terms. Then I would send it to them. And then we'd talk about it over the phone together. Chink, 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 chink. Okay. Then sign and then send it out the door. And again, to the other agent, remember, you text them and say, because you've already had the conversation. You've already told them, hey, an offer is coming. We'll be sending it by end of day or whatever it is, by midnight tonight. And I'll text you when I send it because then they know to look for it. I, uh, I've had offers go to my junk before because sometimes it comes from a weird address or different things. So it's really important to do that. Yes, avoid rookie mistakes. But you know what's crazy is that I'll work with sometimes experienced agents that make rookie mistakes. So don't feel like, like if anything, you're going to be really good at being able to say, okay, here's what we're doing. Yes. Okay. Let me just look at this. So present the offer. Okay. Offer checklist, follow instructions, um, email. Okay. And like, like we talk, kind of talked about just now, double check all the documents, add everything to command. Um, and, and like I said, there just shouldn't be a lot of surprises if you've done all of this upfront, uh, receive and respond, make sure the offer is complete again, prequal letter. Um, confirmation, receive offer. I've had sometimes, like if you have a deal that maybe is contingent, um, and just so you know, like if it's like, let's say I'm on, I'm the listing agent. We have buyers coming from California, right? And their house is under contract. I will sometimes call, ask them, I'll say, can I talk to your agent in California? Because I want to know how ironclad that deal is that it's going forward. Does that make sense? So like, and that's to protect my sellers, right? 
So, but a lot of times I'm now doing quite a few deals um, with like out of state or relocations. And I will talk to those agents in the other state. But I, I didn't know that that was common. I'm representing the buyers. They're, set, they're listing their homes in California. Mm -hmm. Their listing agent called me. I don't know why it's not listed yet, but how much information do I give her about I would ask, buyers? like, your client. Is it the same client? Yeah. The same. I would ask your client up front and say, are you comfortable with me talking to your agent in California? And a lot of times they want you to because they want. Oh, I think it's a great idea. I, I like it because a lot of times it's to line up dates. There you go. Well, and I, a lot of times it's to line up dates. And also because I want to make sure if there's a problem in California with their California house, I better be their second call after their client, like to call me and say, hey, FYI, there's a little hiccup and this is what it looks like because then I want to know right away. So I like to be in touch with if they're selling a home with that other agent. And um, um, sometimes, and sometimes your clients will want it. Like sometimes the clients will say, hey, will you talk to our agent in Utah? We're working with an agent in Utah and we just want you to dialogue. Because a lot of times they don't, they want the professionals to figure out the dates together. Because I just have another example, this guy moving from Vermont, like later this month. And his agent, like, didn't call me back and then said, oh, hey, we're going to write up, we're going to accept this offer. Well, she accepted this offer for like the, it was like 28th of December or something. Like, basically, they're going to settle. So we have a little settlement date issue now. So we're going to have to move that one up by two days so that he can drive out here and close on this one. So being in touch with that other agent is great, but I always ask permission. I always say, Hey, are you okay with me talking or do you want? And most of the time they're like, yes, I want you to talk to them because a lot of these terms they don't know, or it's, you know, this is some, sometimes they just haven't done this for years. So they just want, again, confidence. They want to make sure that like there's a plan and that you figured out what's happening right with their house out here so that they can have a smooth transition because that's the last thing they want to be, you know, freaking out about is driving over and then going, oh, actually, wait, we're not closing here for three days and you're going to be stuck in a hotel, you know, so I would do that. Um, sometimes when I was a newer agent too, and I sometimes still do this in the, I'll do like an executive summary, like in an email. So then I go to say, here's, especially if it's a multiple offer situation, I will highlight the amazing parts about our offer in the email that where the offer is attached. So I'll say, you know, we are a cash buyer, you know, or I'll say we can close in less than 30 days or whatever it is. Right. And if it's a multiple offer situation, I've sometimes, this is the other thing I've had the lender call the other agent and say, Hey, these guys are totally good They're It's not a squeaking by situation. You know, just wanted to let you know, here's my phone number. Call me if you have questions. And I like that. And I, I will do that sometimes in a multiple offer situation. And I don't mind when somebody else's lender calls me to tell me, Hey, this is a great buyer, you know? So, um, Yeah, any time that you can get that, um, I mean, that's great. And then they talk about command, which I'm really the worst at. <laughs> so, so I'm not going to go over that. Talk to Hunter about that. But anyway, um, I think everything is pretty self. I'm just going to flip through these. Just reaching a decision, you know, we kind of talked about that and the different points. And I compare when you make and receive offers, it's like playing a game of tennis right? You're serving the ball at one point. After you, you have full control as an agent up until that offer is accepted. And then they're serving it back to you, right? And there's two times when you're on the listing side that they're serving the ball back to you. And that's, you know, during due diligence, right? And the questions they come up with, the home inspection, um, whatever it might be. And then also during appraisal, right? And so those are two times when like, 
I hate that that's out of my control, right? There's a lot of things that then it's up to a third party or something. So, um, so just remember that and then respond to the offer. I mean, again, we already kind of talked about that and um, really tracking is important. So going back to kind of this fourth quarter of mine, I finally was just like, you know what? I am going to have a great fourth quarter. And I started believing it and I started just saying it and I started tracking it. And you know what I did? I got out my Google, my little Apple notes and I just said how many people I talked with, how many people um, I put under contract. And just by looking at it, like the weeks that I would have like zero, um, you know, listing agreement signed, then I knew that next week I needed to talk to some people. And I just would manifest it. I'd be like, this week I'm getting a listing. Okay. And then, and then I would do it, you know? So really tracking, I don't care if it's in your phone, a spreadsheet, whatever, just do it because if nothing else, it's going to give you a visual on what you need to be doing a little bit. And, um, and then there's, again, no surprises at the end. Um, just, they always want us to just remind you just, you know, the do not call list and stuff. But one of my other things I want to just really um, talk to you just really briefly, and then we're done, I think, um, is like practicing and really just practicing. But also one of the questions I get from people is they'll say, okay, how do I get into luxury or how do I get into this or whatever? What I, my recommendation is, is start with what you know. Okay. And even in your own neighborhood, become the expert of your neighborhood or in your friend group of, you know, people like Lucas, you're going to have friends that are all of a sudden like, okay, I'm going to be getting ready to buy a house. Don't get short-sighted. I just got back from a meeting with Gary Keller and he talked about this and this was a really good reminder for me even. He's like, look at your 2024 and 2025. Like, don't be so short-sighted to just only be looking at your current. So when I started doing that, I got back from a meeting with him um, about six weeks ago. And I just opened myself up and said, I want to start by having under contracts for next year. I'm not even kidding you. Within these last three few weeks, I now have 170,000 in GCI already for next year. Like under contract, new builds. Um, I talked to my friend, they're for sure listing their home with me. Like it's a good friend of mine. We're just deciding on when. So I started to track and say, who are my clients for 2024? But the problem is real estate agents don't, we tend to think of this right now. And that's why a lot of agents drop early on too, because they don't see the fruits of their labor, right? Right away. It takes time, but start looking at your 2024 and 2025. I already have two deals for 2025. One's going to be a parade of homes. It's a new build. They're closing on the lot this week, and then they're going to be in the parade of homes in a year and a half. I already have that home. I will probably get 50000 in commission. I already have 170000 in commission built in for next year and 50000 for 2025. So be thinking. And so like Lucas, especially like I'm just thinking, I'm, I'm targeting you. And Bella, Ella in the back. And, and Brindley, yes, all the young. And, and us too. Don't get me wrong. All like, you know, but I'm just saying. Just know that your friends are going to be buying homes and selling homes. And so never the problem. And I remember this, like from when I was younger and I remember talking to somebody and they didn't really want to give me the time of day because I wasn't going to be closing in 30 days. Does that make sense? So think of the people that are going to be closing in two years and then you create a plan to stay in touch with them so that you are their agent by the time they roll around. So be thinking of how you can talk to them about home ownership, how you can talk to them about, hey, this is really important and just stay in touch with them so that it's already cemented in that you're their realtor. But Gary Keller's point on that was really a great reminder for me that I need to realize that there are people in my pipeline 
like the ultra hots, yes, those are the ones I want to spend a lot of time with, right? The ones that are closing in 30 to 90 days. But don't ignore those other people. And by the way, if you spend time with them now, those people that are going to be selling or buying in the next two years, they're going to tell their friends who are buying and selling in less than two years how great you were that you spent time with them and you talked to them about what to do to save up for a home or whatever it is. So those have been some of my greatest leads um, are people that are sometimes two years out. So because then they go, oh, but I know somebody else that's selling or my daughter or she wants to buy a home or whatever it is. So don't underestimate those pipelines. And like I said, just looking at what my trajectory is for next year, it is crazy because I'm like, I could hit a million GCI next year and I probably will. And, and I will be, I'm going to be a millionaire real estate agent, but that's my goal for next year, like business wise. And, um, and like I said, it's because also just remember in the pipeline to like, not forget about those people as well. So Anyway, so that is our whole class time, but what other, do you have questions for me or what are your ahas? I'd love to hear what ahas you had. Oh, I know how to do it. Oh, right, it's probably, okay. But what are your ahas? Okay, Lucas. I like how um, before sending the offer, you ask them about what they might need for response. So like, if you see a problem, what's the same boat? And it makes you look more professional. I'm going to say that too, because then when you have a plan and you're more confident and you can see if you're not too far off, right? You're going to know pretty much if that deal's going to work or not. So good. I'm glad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 100%. And so that way, and it saves a lot of time even for Jeanette later, but it saves like time for you. And again, it helps just articulate a plan. So I love that. Good. Stacy. Exactly. Yep. Perfect. Natalie. Yeah. Well, and like I said, don't don't think that there aren't things that happen along the way. <laughs> yeah, but good. Yep. Perfect. Or the other side too. Okay, Ella. Anything? Yeah. Mm hmm Yes. No, but that that's, I mean, that's part of it, right? I mean, if you're not prospecting and talking to people, you're not going to be writing offers. <laughs> so, and again, I think kind of pipeline, right? Just remember, there are people in that pipeline that are not, yes, you want to find those ones that want something in the next 90 days, but the ones in 18 months are still going to pay an amazing, you know, commission thing. My other piece of advice real quick before I get to friendly is the first year that I was an agent, I did not look at what percentage ever I was being paid on a deal. I made that a thing because I wanted to always do the right thing for the right reason. I never looked at what was the buyer's agent commission. And I'm not, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just telling you that's what I did. Um, but the reason is because if you do, and I'm a big believer in, if you do what's right for your client, it always comes back tenfold as well. Like I once had to write up an offer. It was a $2,000 commission. It was a FISBO for sale by owner with 13 siblings, 13 older siblings. And it was a beast of a transaction. But then because I did it and they knew I'd hardly got paid any money on that, they were only offering a flat fee of $2,000 commission. They knew because I did that, 
they listed their million dollar condo with me and they listed two other properties. So, okay, Brinley. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there's some people, even if they need help with like credit or just explaining to them and saying, hey, this is how this works, you know. But if you spend time with people up front and they know you care, you are their realtor for life, you know. And I, I kind of joke around with my clients and say that I'm like, well, I'm hoping I earn to earn the place of being your realtor for life because I want that. I want you to know that I I have your best interest always. Yeah. Yes. Regardless, I mean, I've, I've only worked with two. One has been beyond um, and one was not so fun. And I've learned from both of them. Mm -hmm. um, and you learn how to treat other. You, you go, you know what? I don't want that as well, you know, so. Well, good. Well, thanks, everyone. It was it was fun. Thank you. I hope that it was good, even though I didn't stick to the slides. Super awesome. I but, like yeah. you know, nothing else.